point thirty eight ways to leave your lover. Poker's got a gun. It's a S U N D A Y fight. And an interview with Dr. Maggie Langston's Devin Kelly. Get ready. This is going to be an epic episode of Resurrection Revealed. Welcome back for our full discussion of Resurrection Revealed Home. This is an unofficial podcast and blog by and for fans of ABC TV's Resurrection with theories and a lot more. Recorded April 16th, 2014. I'm Wayne Henderson, the voice acting podcasting Green Bay Packers fan. And I'm Troy Heinrichs, giving at least 38% effort tonight since I just returned from a long trip, but excited to be here nonetheless as we dive deeper into episode six. So why don't we start out right at the top of the show with the love triangle? That's mysterious in itself. Is that like the Bermuda Triangle, Troy? It depends. You know, if you get sucked in between this conversation between Eric Ward, the new doctor guy, Maggie, and of course, Agent Bellamy, you may just get sucked into, do they have relationship feelings for each other? Uh, And that could be either Eric Ward towards Maggie, or it could be Bellamy towards Maggie. You never know. And with Bellamy and Maggie, it seemed to be the signs were as clear as day that there was a relationship brewing but this past week, they took a step back, at least, we, you know, of course, bringing in that other guy that does confuse things. So without getting all relationshipy on Resurrection Revealed, i uh, going to have to wait and see. <laughs> well, and, it, and it's really interesting because Devin Kelly will talk about this in her interview in a little bit. But, you know, I think maybe Bellamy was hurt on two levels, right? Number one is, you know, here she made a decision on her own without consulting Bellamy. So this kind of maybe puts a wedge between their relationship and that perspective. And then of course, now maybe Bellamy is realizing what Maggie can do as a person. And so he's now viewing her with a different set of eyes. So that way, if you consider that perspective, then maybe this whole, you know, asking her out to dinner a couple episodes ago might actually have some deeper meaning. You know, after talking about all the relationships on revenge, I'm still trying to figure out resurrection, the science side. And of course we, have the self-protection weaponry there in the room. There's a uh, 38 special, which is all well and good. Those are fine weapons to uh, target shoot with. But then all of a sudden, next thing I knew, we're opening up a can of worms with math and all sorts of good stuff going on that's going to blow our minds. Yeah, I mean, uh, we had a couple theories come in about this whole .38. Uh, The one that I found really interesting, and we'll get to another one later in the listener comments, but this 0.38. So if you consider the fact that as they're having this discussion that they're trying to figure out, well, are they the same people? Are they clones? Is it this whole multiverse conversation and all of that jazz? But something is different about the return, right? They don't sleep. They eat more. So part of them is technically different. So if you think of a whole, we'll call that the number one, right? And subtract 0.38 from number one, we actually get 0.62, And there's actually this really interesting uh, element uh, in math and science and physics called the golden ratio. And basically, the golden ratio is when the reciprocal of the two numbers equals 1.61. So if you look at this 0.62 and take its reciprocal, it's actually 1.61 something something rounded up. It's basically the golden ratio, close enough for for math on a podcast anyway. (laughs) Really, what this golden ratio is, is like, let's say you take a square, right? And the square has a length of five, five units. Doesn't matter what the units are. Is it a chocolate square? Could be. So let's take chocolate. We'll take a chocolate square because that's even a golden golden foil wrapped chocolate square. Perfect. Take the chocolate square. It's got a length of five. And then if you take a rectangle, but stand it on the tall end, so it's it's standing on the short end next to the square that length of the rectangle is also five. So when you look at it, it's almost like two thirds on the left, one third on the right, but just a little bit off that third line mark. And so that's where the artistic stuff comes into play because you talk about you know your rule of thirds and photography and art. And there was actually a gentleman back in 1509 named Luca Pacioli who actually advocated that the golden ratios application yields harmonious and pleasing proportions in a book that he wrote. So 
maybe that has something to do with the returned in the fact that, you know, there's a harmonious and a pleasing relationship or proportion to the family members that are they're coming back to, or it's just a bunch of hootenanny, <laughs> but it seems really, you know, convenient that this point three eight was brought up. So it has to have some major significance in the overall theme of the show. Now, I have two things. One, is this in the book, The Return by Jason Mott? Not at all. <laughs> oh, okay, good. And the other thing I want to say is 4, 8, 15, 16, 23, 42. Uh, yes. After those numbers, I can't make sense out of the rest. And I'm more of an 80 20 guy instead of the uh, two thirds, but that's just me. Well, that's kind of where this falls. It's almost on that 80 20 rule. That's why people say 80% of the time, you know, things are good enough. You know, and and I think if you lay lay these down side by side, you kind of get close to that eighty twenty mark. So, who knows? Maybe the eighty twenty was the golden ratio after all. But uh, if you want to read more about this golden ratio concept, we'll put the link to our show notes there. It'll be at resurrectionrevealed dot com slash fourteen. I believe this episode is. It is fourteen. We'll be sure to have that link in there. Now, I bumped into a lady here in town who, because of course I want to talk about resurrection with all sorts of people and she asked if we saw the event horizon uh beer logo and she is positive that this plays into the overall story that might be going on here because she loved that movie event horizon do you think that that might be a shout out or is it just a cool sounding name for a beer well it could mean two things right it could be related to the movie and the themes of the movie or it could be just what is known as the event horizon Typically, most people associate the event horizon with a black hole, right? So if you look at what the kind of definition of the event horizon is, it's basically the point of no return, right? In layman's terms, it's basically the point where a gravitational pull becomes so great that it almost makes the escape impossible. Doesn't say that it's not possible, just says almost makes it impossible. And so, you know, is Arcadia kind of that event horizon where... You know, these returned are coming back and we've seen Caleb escape, but maybe nobody else can. It's something mm. to think about. And we did talk a little bit about black holes just a couple of weeks ago on the on the podcast as well. Kind of a recurring theme, possibly. So Ooh. we'll have to wait and see. Now, apparently, Troy, love your neighbor isn't practiced at all churches anymore, at least not in Arcadia. Wow. Kevin Sizemore's character, Gary Humphreys, with a little bit of goading there from Helen, it all went down this week. Yeah, I mean, it's really an interesting sequence of events as you watch the churchgoers in their quest or, you know, day-to-day -day activities. When you sit back and think about how are you supposed to act as a Christian, you know, even someone like Helen, you know, obviously she's confused, she's conflicted, she doesn't know what to do. You know, her pastor that she trusts has basically kind of betrayed her in her mind. But at the same time, it almost seems like Helen has it out for Pastor Tom. Like she's seeking out, you know, information from his wife and seeking out information to try to figure out a way, like just have an excuse to leave the church. And so is that a very Christian thing to do? I mean, if you're a Christian, should you you know, stand by your pastor and kind of support him and, and try to understand versus going around his back, having secret board meetings. And then of course, inviting the entire town to show up on Sunday morning, which clearly doesn't happen on a regular basis, especially for Henry. Not to mention going around town and having meetings with uh, the wife and the pregnant returned and just talking to everybody that she could possibly talk to. I think we need to get a hold of Veronica Cartwright who plays Helen on Resurrection and see if she can give us some insight because there, there's got to be more to the character of Helen than what we've picked up on so far. Yeah, especially if she's kind of uh, in that, what was it, the second or third episode we meet her for the first time and she's dealing with the kids at the school and then of course she was out on the playground and took her grandchild away from the playground in episode two. So, you know, there's more to her that's going on we just have to kind of understand where she's coming from. Right. Yes. A lot of people on Twitter during the episode are like, Oh, I can't stand Helen. You're like, Helen's so evil. And, you know, and I don't know if Helen's really an evil character. She's maybe a misunderstood character. We'll just have to wait and see, but not for long. Now, the one thing that kind of tied into the book this week a little bit was this conversation about, you know, 
could Jacob go somewhere? In the book, it's different, but in the show, it's going to be NIH out in Bethesda, Maryland. And they have the option of, well, if you want to come with, you can. And of course, they kind of toy with that throughout the course of the episode. Right. Because that's very much a similar theme in the book where, you know, in the book, Lucille stays home and Henry actually goes with. His name's Harold in the book, but, you know, Harold goes with and, and Lucille stays home. So it's interesting that at the end of the day, they both decided that after they agreed to let Jacob into their lives fully, that they're now willing to give him up to go to Bethesda on his own. Well, apparently they have a lot of trust already with Agent Bellamy. And at the same time, the way things are going there in Arcadia, Missouri on the show, it might actually be safer for Jacob to go to Maryland and not stay in this town because things are really escalating. So that's got to be a really tough decision to make. But in the end, he kind of trusts what uh, Dr. Langston's friend says and Bellamy and, uh, you know, the they'll stay behind i guess they're in arcadia and just kind of stay abreast of what's going on in the town because uh it's going to be interesting and i i think a season one cliffhanger is coming our way in a couple weeks well and i think their decision is really based off of the situation of the church because you know even though they might have trust in bellamy how much trust does bellamy have in dr eric ward right and i think after you know agent bellamy's passed you don't want to give the Langston's false hope when you don't really know much about Dr. Ward to begin with. So I really think that Henry and Lucille's decision came mostly out of, we got to get him out of town because the town is a scary place to be right now. No doubt. Now we've seen the the hashtag on Twitter and Facebook, especially relation to our, uh, our buddy Travis who plays Ray using the phrase or hashtag Ray knows. And apparently Ray was right. And basically he tells his sister, Elaine, I told you so. It's like, you know, it was a big deal that that was not their dad. Apparently not. And he was right. But at the same time, you know, Elaine delivers that line. Like, I know, Ray, I know. Was she patronizing him at that point? Because in the jail cell last week during insomnia, you know, she's basically throwing it out there. Like, you're no different. You're the same person. You know, you haven't changed. And, yada 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 so to elaine caleb is her dad i mean he's no different than the former caleb as she was growing up so why is she still patronizing ray is it just to make him feel comfortable and accepted and that like everything's okay now that's a good question troy i'm just glad that that ray's back brother and sister are together in the house again whether or not we ever see caleb again it's too early to tell but at least they're back together again now Overall, this was a really, really good episode of Resurrection. Um, I'd give this one an 8 out of 10 trips to buy coffee instead of being out searching for serial killers. Interesting rating. Uh, <laughs> an 8. Yeah, I give it a 7 out of 10. Bellamy stares of uncertainty. Ooh, concise and to the point, Troy. I like yeah, it. I yeah, it, it, it's a little bit of a downturn from last week because last week was just so epic with the with the rubber ball and tying it back into the earlier scenes and then of course the disappearing act, you know. But you know the thirty eight, the you know this is probably one of these other like things where okay maybe we do have a new loss on our hands because the theories that we got coming up in a little bit are absolutely spectacular. Oh, I will say absolutely along with you and you know seven even seven out of ten. There are a ton of other shows on television that will never reach the status of having an episode rated a seven. Just saying. This is true. And some of those get canceled before they even get out past season episode two. So, yes, seven out of ten. I, I mean, we do have the break for Easter. We'll be back, you know, after that for the last two. I think the last two are just going to be, you know, full game on to try to get people excited and Hopefully right after that, we'll get a nice, uh, you know, mid-May present of a season two pickup. So keep your fingers crossed, fans, because any day now, any day, it's got to come across the wire. I cannot wait. You know, with the ratings the way they are, th this is something that is a surefire hit. They should definitely bring it back. And everybody stay tuned. We've got the listener feedback coming up a little later in the episode. Like Troy said, it's going to blow your mind. And we're going to have our special interview with Devin Kelly in just a minute. Have you ever wanted to share something with someone just because? Well, we do a lot. So we started a podcast about 
Well, whatever we want. My name is Joyce. And I'm her lovely husband, Al. Uh, well, you know what I mean. Hey, it's me, Al. Listen, I'm hijacking the Just Because podcast to start a new series all about the wonderful world of voice acting. Each episode, I'll have a professional voice actor on and ask them some serious, hard-hitting questions to get to the bottom of this in a world. You know, world. If you've ever wanted to know about the inner workings of this magical and mystical business, tune into Just Because Inside the VoiceOver Studio. Tune in at JustBecausePodcast.com and on iTunes. Well, Resurrection fans, we are here once again with another great cast interview for you. Of course, this week we saw Dr. Maggie Langston kind of go out on her own and make a phone call that may just be the downfall to the returned and their status within Arcadia. So we welcome to the program the wonderful Devin Kelly with us this week. Devin, how are you? I'm great. How are you? Doing great. Doing great. I guess we'll start off with the easy question first. We want to know what drew you to the material? Why did you end up getting attached to Resurrection? And of course, did you read the book as part of that process? I read the script first and I heard about the premise. I think I was filled in on the tagline and I thought it sounded a bit cheesy. I'm, I thought it was going to be very scientific y. Um, more alien zombies. I didn't really know what what the vibe of the show was supposed to be. And so before I read the script, I'd kind of already put it in the box in my brain. Like, yeah, I don't think I'm going to be into that. I'm more about drama and characters and not really about some phenomenon happening. But by page two of the script, I was just blown away. Aaron Bellman, our creator and writer, wrote a beautiful story. It's about people. It's not about this big event that happens. It's really about what the people who are affected by it go through. And so that's what really drew me into it. And uh, I went through the audition process and thank goodness that the directors and producers and everyone thought that I fit the bill. And so I'm so lucky that I get to play Maggie. And uh, in terms of the book, I did get a copy. We all got a copy of the book uh, during the pilot. And so we were reading it during the pilot. We got to meet Jason Mott, the author of the book, who is a wonderful, sweet man. He came to set a couple times. So that was really cool to just hear his story, how how this premise came about and how why he decided to write this novel. So we all developed a bit of a relationship with him. And then just throughout the series, you know, our series doesn't exactly follow the book, but it's just been nice to use the book as a touchstone and go back once in a while and just uh, get lost in the imagery that Jason Mott created. He's a very poetical writer. And so, so every once in a while, I just pick it up again and peruse just to remind myself of the world in which we're living. Yeah, what a great twist last week with Caleb disappearing for those that are book readers. I thought that was <laughs> really awesome to kind of accelerate that. Uh, that was nuts when we read that script. We were all like, w- what? <laughs> How is that? What? <laughs> I think we all react the same way that the audiences do every week. I mean, we did it when we read the script. You bundle in the fact that Rachel has the baby, which of course is kind of the catalyst for you to kind of step out on your own this week to call your good friend Eric Ward. What kind of went on with that in Maggie's head as you kind of prepped this scene? Was it something that you consciously knew was going to go against Bellamy? Or was this kind of like, eh, it's just a doctor thing. It's not a big deal. I know. I think a lot of thought went into it. But at the, you know, is this going to affect me and Bellamy? I think really the main point is Maggie's MO is what is the best thing to do for these returns? What is the best thing to do for our town? What is the best thing to do for the situation? So I think Maggie genuinely believes that Eric can be a great help to the situation. He's a very intelligent man. He's very accomplished. She trusts him. It's not just calling a random person from the NIH and be like, hey, guess what? And, you know, opening up that whole can of worms and totally exposing everything. She calls someone that she trusts and has a deep past with. And so I think that makes the, um, the reveal that he wants to take Jacob to Bethesda to study him. I think that because she knows Eric, she's that much more hurt and shocked and surprised. All of those things rolled into one because she thought, I'm bringing in a safe person. I'm bringing in someone that, yes, can can maybe solve this mystery, but also he can keep it on the down low. And when he doesn't do that, Meg is kind of caught between 
Bellamy and Eric in a very different way where Bellamy can kind of have a, a chance to say, I told you so. Does that come from somewhere as you were developing this relationship with Eric? How much did they give you? Is there a past that seemed, at least to the viewers anyway, in the episode this week, that Eric kind of had some feelings for Maggie, kind of coaxing her to come out to Maryland and, and be with him? Did you get to build that out? Or is that something we're going to see more as the past is a character, as Aaron Zellman has said? It might develop a little bit more. You might get a couple more nuggets, but what I was told literally on the day of filming as, you know, Eric walked in, I was like, who is this character? Or James Tupper walked in, rather. The story that Aaron has created is that Maggie and, and Eric had a bit of a relationship when she was in school. He was her professor, and they had a relationship, and it was, you know, substantial. It was quite serious, but upon graduation, Maggie decided to return to... Arcadia, and I think that was something that he tried to fight against. You know, I think she he tried to convince Maggie to come to the NIH or come work at you know work at this university or whatever. I think Maggie had a lot of opportunities laid out for her, but she decided to return home instead. And Eric has never really been able to accept that or comprehend that. And that's where the comment, um, you know, I'm not, I wasn't about the accolades or I'm not about the accolades. I think that's where that comes from. Is that Maggie's always just wanted to do the work and keep it simple, where Eric is a bit more bigger picture. He likes the energy and the fanciness of being in a really hot spot in the science world. And Maggie doesn't need that, which I think is ultimately why it wouldn't work between them. It kind of goes back to that being rooted right in Arcadia. I love the, the fact that we have this you know tree imagery in the opening credits, and then you use the, mm. the phrase being rooted in Arcadia. And I guess with the town... How big is this clinic? I mean, you've been running around the woods, you've been hanging out with Bellamy, trying to do more police <laughs> investigation work, kind of following in your father's footsteps. Like, how many doctors are at this clinic? Uh, we decided there are about there are about two, two or three other doctors there. You know, we we really only focus on Maggie in that world, and she is the youngest doctor there. Probably, she's definitely deeply tied in the town so everyone knows her and she's very familiar with all the patients. I don't think it's really that that large. You know, the, Maggie's childhood doctor could potentially be a doctor there now as well. And so now she's working alongside him. But yeah, it does seem like she has a lot of free time to gallivant about, doesn't it? She's kind of let her patients slide in the past week or so, I think. And is that put her about age 30, 32? We know that you and kind of Elaine have grown up over the years. Uh, right. She was 19, I believe, when Caleb passed away. And then taking Caleb's return date puts her at about 32. So I don't know if you guys were about yeah. the same age. Yeah, we're about the same age. We would have, um, we've been friends since we were babies. So we would have gone, grown up in school together and all of that. Speaking of babies, the big bombshell right out of the gate, which I think most viewers are kind of maybe a little frustrated with, if nothing else, was this whole, you know, is uh, Sam Catlin your dad? So <laughs> does Maggie take that answer? Because if you're a doctor, right, you're taking the science approach and you'd want to have, mm-hmm. you know, information and, and test these theories. And, you know, you wouldn't stop until you had a scientific answer of, yes, he's my dad. No, he's not. So are we going to see a return to that storyline at all? Well, I think... I think in terms of taking the scientific approach, this is so emotional. I think even as a doctor and as a very good doctor, it's hard for Maggie to approach this scientifically. And so much of our show is about what do you choose to believe? So I think Maggie chooses to believe that Sam Catlin is not her father. And even if he was genetically, say that really Fred is not related to Maggie by blood, Fred will always be her father. Sam Catlin will never be the man that raised her from, you know, from the day her mother died up until now. So emotionally, Fred will always be Maggie's parent. So with that in her brain, I don't think it really matters if Sam if Sam is genetically related to her. That's not the point. He's not there. He's not going to be a part of her life. And she's going to choose to believe that he was telling the truth, which I, as Devin, also genuinely believe that he was telling the truth, um, that he was telling the truth, and then that she can carry on her relationship with her father knowing that they are blood and they are all they have, essentially. Yeah, because who your father is shouldn't really matter when we look at the show, because it's all about family. Because if you take Jacob, exactly. you know, it's a matter of the Langstons are like, it doesn't matter which Jacob is here, family is family, you care about a person mm-hmm. no matter what. So I think that's great. Exactly, Yeah. 
and like Elaine is family, you know, everyone in this town is, is family in a way, and Bellamy's kind of, you know, the watcher on the outside, and he's slowly working his way into the fold. You know, he obviously has a very great relationship with the Langstons. Maggie and Bellamy are getting very close, and, um, yeah, everyone's very tangled. Everyone really cares for each other, so when this huge bomb is dropped, it, you know, people's true colors really reveal themselves, and real, the past, you know, like Aaron said, the past is a character, and the past is dredged up, and that might be something that all these people have tried to shove in the closet because they can't go on living and loving each other with knowing everything that's happened before. But deep down, of course, Maggie really wants her mom to come back too. We're assuming oh, of anyway. She does. Yes. And of course, the fans is. were just like, "Come on, Fred, put the ring on, put the ring on your finger, and she'll I appear." Know. <laughs> that was such a great scene. Matt Craven's just the best. So do we think Barbara's going to be coming back anytime soon before the season's out? I don't know. I mean, I really hope, I, re- I think Maggie really hopes that, of course. And the cool thing about playing Maggie, this is, was so great, because I was thinking the same thing, you know, as the audience, where every time I get a script, I was like, ah, oh, is she back yet? Is she back? Um, and the, and I think the, the I love that Aaron has kept Maggie on this path of helping other people and dealing with the task at hand, okay, dealing with Jacob, dealing with Rachel, dealing with Elaine and trying to help her and being a good friend to her. We haven't seen Maggie be selfish yet, and, you know, there's no moments of self-pity, like, oh, why can't my mom come back? I really wanted this. She pushes all that aside like a true professional and like a really sweet human and deals with the people in this town that need her rather than you know, sitting and, and wishing and hoping for something that hasn't happened for her and may not happen for her. Which I think builds up to some big reveal that if Barbara does come back, you get this kind of pent up emotion, right? As an actor to be able to outpour that all at once after six or right, seven episodes, exactly. huge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I think a lot of it, you know, especially Maggie and Fred, because we're kind of the more, um, you know, held back emotionally, the the more restrained characters of the series so it'll it'll be interesting to see how the season ends for us and that if we actually get to have some sort of catharsis or if we just keep bottled up until next season and then we had a question coming from twitter from the fans grace asked if you Devin, relate to maggie in any way and does maggie do you kind of pull some of that stuff back into your own life um yeah i definitely relate to maggie she's really you know i grew up in the midwest as well so i think Maggie's very grounded and she's very loyal and the people in her life are very important to her and she really nurtures the relationships that she has and um, I like to think as Devin I do the same thing I'm very close with my parents Um, I have a best friend just like Elaine we've been best friends since we were five and we have a pretty similar relationship to Maggie and Elaine not like either you know not like my friend's that parent has come back. I really just like how how straightforward and, and honest Maggie is, and that's what drew me in, and I try to be that in my life, and I try to bring that into my work. That's awesome. And then we had Ashlyn. She actually sent in a voicemail to our uh, feedback line at resurrectionrevealed.com slash feedback. Let me go ahead and play this for you, Devin. Who do you have fun with out of the cast of Resurrection? And also, off screen, what's your favorite thing to do? All right. Who do I have the most fun with? Um, I mean, I have fun with everyone, but uh, Samira and I are very close. It's so great. We film in Atlanta, so it's so great to have each other in Atlanta. We do yoga together and we get our nails done, you know, things that best friends do. And then also Matt Craven and I are very, very close. Um, We have a total blast. We, We do weird things. Like we found a river to canoe on in Atlanta one weekend. I mean, we just try to, we just like imagine adventures and we go have them. It's a really great, sweet father daughter team, but all of us have a total blast. Omar makes me laugh a lot on set. He's very, very funny. I owe a lot of money to Landon's swear jar. So that's too bad. And what do I like to do off screen? I, Love doing yoga. I do yoga every day, and that's my that's my thing. That's the thing that makes me happy. That's the thing that makes me feel normal. I can't function without it. Well, it's a good thing he's collecting that money for the swear jar too, because I know how much he likes his pudding, so he can keep that stocked up. <laughs> Seriously, it's so bad. Like I just I can't help it. I have such a potty mouth, and this poor kid. I mean, he just sits there with his hands over his ears half the time. 
uh, Wayne actually was uh, bummed he couldn't be here today uh, to do the interview, but he was noticing on your Twitter profile that you're a lover of the harmonica and kind of <laughs> wanted to know the story of how that came to be. There really isn't much of a story, but I just love harmonicas. I think they sound great. My grandpa used to play the harmonica, and I loved it. So I can't play. I don't even know if I own one. I don't think I do. I just love harmonicas. I, I, that's it. They make me happy. And then, of course, we had uh, Matt kind of had the same question I had back on Twitter. You know, you're on other shows, of course. Covert Affairs, one of my absolute favorites. Uh, oh. Chicago Code, which totally got canceled way before its time. <clears throat> So Matt's question and my question is, how do you handle the uncertainty as the actor, the waiting period, now that we're getting close to the May upfronts and we still don't have official word on a season two, although DVR ratings and everything seems to be going well for ABC. How do you mm-hmm. fill your time while you're kind of like waiting for the next big thing? Um, well, right now I'm rehearsing a play. I just started rehearsing a play last week. So I'm really consumed with that, which is great. It's just perfect timing because I'm not sitting at home hoping that I have a job next season. So I'm really distracted right now. I'm just on to the next thing and focusing on this next project. But uh, it definitely is a balance. It's really trying to to figure out how to, you know, you sort of have to hope for the best and prepare for the worst and know that if the show goes, then fine. There's something else around the corner. And the, um, if it goes away, I mean, then okay, and you just have to deal with that and on to the next thing. And if it stays, then just count your blessings and we'll just be so happy that we have a season two and we have that many more episodes handed to us to entertain people and tell good stories. With Chicago Code, it was a you know, 13 episode order. Do you like the shorter series or do you like the full 22? What's your take on that? Um, well, I've never done a full 22. I've only done, you know, this, I, I did bits and pieces of covert affairs. I was pretty interspersed. And then, um, Chicago Code was, yeah, 13 and this was eight. So I, I really, I just like working. I like working and I like being on set and I love this cast and I love this story. So I will do this. I could do this all day, every day. Eight felt like too short. Like it just flew by. And by the time we're done with episode eight, all of us were like, wait, what? Let me just get here. What's happening? But that being said, selfishly, you know, I I would like to do this all year long. But in terms of story, I don't know if Resurrection is really a 22-episode show. It seems like the the shorter order is really, really con- conducive to what we're trying to do over here because it is a bit more drawn out and it's slower. And, you know, we kind of are just slowly but surely peeling back the, the layers and I think with 22, the, it, it might get a bit thin. You know, I kind of like that, that our storylines have to be more condensed. And then we've been doing kind of a rapid fire segment with all of the, the cast. So this is going to be a, how would you answer? And then how would Maggie answer? Just to see if we can get a little bit more insight into Maggie's character. So, oh, okay. All right. So we'll go with uh, favorite color, you and Maggie. Me and Maggie. Okay. Devin, black. Maggie, yellow. Sunshine, very nice. Favorite food? <laughs> Favorite food, Devin, peanut butter, Maggie, cheeseburgers. Favorite music style? Um, Devin, indie, Maggie, I think what's ever on the radio. I don't think she's really into music. She's not dancing in the OR like they are in Grey's Anatomy at all? <laughs> Maybe next season. Favorite movie? Favorite movie, Devin, almost famous, Maggie, Sleepless in Seattle. I like that. That's very good. The hopeless romantic, right? I guess so. I don't know where that came from. Uh, well, we don't know, right? Because everybody's like, oh, does she got something for Bellamy? Is there something going on there? <laughs> and now Eric's right. in the mix. I know. It's getting messy. Well, Omar even played it off a little this week, assuming that it was going to be, he seemed like, you know, I'm perturbed that you didn't ask me before you called. But then it almost seemed like he was a little jealous this week. A little bit. Yeah. I think, I, I think it's kind of a, a multitude of things. There's someone encroaching on his territory in terms of what's going on in the town. And also, I think maybe Bella be surprised to see Maggie as a person for the first time, like interacting with someone as a human rather than as a doctor or as a daughter. I think that's a little like, oh, maybe he looked at Maggie with new eyes or through Eric's eyes. I'm not quite sure. That, that's a question for Omar. I don't know how he feels. Yeah, very good. Very good. Uh, favorite season of the year? Summer for Devin and I think summer for Maggie as well. And then of course the tough question, this one kind of surprised Darren Zellman when we asked him if you had one person from the past 
come back to life, who would you have come back? And then what one question would you ask them? I think I would, I would have John Lennon come back. That's, that's that. Yep. I would have John Lennon come back. And I don't know if I can boil it down to one question. I would want to sit in a recording studio with the Beatles. So I'm kind of getting, because isn't George Harrison done, so I'm kind of getting like a little more bang for my buck if I say the Beatles. Um, and I just want to sit in the recording studio and just listen and listen to their stories and hang out and drink and just observe their, their shenanigans. I don't know if I can really boil it down to one question. I think that's a great group to bring back, right? Because so much has influenced all of our lives from the stuff that they've brought out from their music, even to this day, still going strong. I think that's a great answer. Thank you. Well, of course, as a fan podcast, the fans obviously love your work, love the show. So is there anything they can do or we can do to help support you in any future projects you're working on or any charities that you may be supporting? Uh, in terms of charities, that's a great question. I'm so glad you asked. I work. I grew up in Minnesota, so I work with a nonprofit theater organization there called Youth Performance Company. And I used to do plays there when I was a kid. And now, as a grown-up, I guess I'm a grown-up, I try to go back and teach and help out as much as I possibly can. But, you know, it's a nonprofit and it's the arts, so they can always use help, time if you're in Minnesota, money if you're not, all those things. But it really, it really shapes who I am as, as an actor now. I wouldn't, I don't think I would be doing this without that organization. Do they have a website that we can put in the show notes, Devin? Um, yeah, I believe it's youthperformanceco.org. And we will have that all up at resurrectionrevealed.com slash Devin. It's been so great having you here, talking to the fans. Thanks for the time. And of course, love everything that you're doing on the show. Thank you very much. I'm so happy to be here. Wow, that was fantastic. Devin taking the time to chat with you, Troy. I really wanted to be there for this interview. And I am so bummed that I missed it. But you did a great job and a lot of inside information there about Dr. Maggie Langston. So that was excellent. Uh, it's so great to get these interviews and have them be part of the Resurrection Revealed podcast. Devin, even though I wasn't there, I want to thank you at this point for uh, joining Troy and being on our Resurrection Revealed podcast. I'm Spacer did give us uh, a little bit of information about that golden rule that I was talking about earlier. But I think this one was actually where, okay, now we have lost on our hands all over again, because when time spacer wrote this in, I was like, okay, we're going off the deep end guys. So hang on to your hats. Basically what time spacer did was he kind of said, okay, if we take Eric Ward's formula, this whole, you know, latitude of where they reappear, minus the latitude of Arcadia, which they said in the show was 40 degrees, even though it's technically off by a little bit. Uh, but for the sake of the show, we're going to call it 40. So if you take where they return, minus the 40 degrees, and then divide it by the number of years they've been gone, you get this 0.38 constant. We've heard Whoa. that before and lost. That got my attention. So what he did was he said, okay, there's got to be then a theoretical maximum of how far back in time you could come back to... or how far back in time you could have died to be able to come back to life, right? So in this case, what he did was he actually said, okay, well, if I take the South Pole, for example, the South Pole is at negative 90. So then you have negative 90 minus 40. That difference divided by 0.38 would get you 342 years, which is something like 1672 if I do my math in my head very quickly on a podcast, which you're not supposed to do. Um so, it, but you have to ignore the sign, right? Because it's obviously negative 90 because you're going south of the equator and all of that negative positive garbage. So don't worry about that. Just assume that one theoretical maximum could be 1,672, which coincidentally is right around the time LaSalle comes down the Mississippi River on his exploration, which is very close to Arcadia, Missouri. So keep that in mind. If you go the other way, all of the returns so far have come back north of the latitude where Arcadia is, right? You know, talked about Portland and, and some of the other places on the East Coast. So if you go to the North Pole, then, then positive 90 minus 40 divided by 0.38, and you get 132 years, which coincides to about 1882, which is right around that Civil War kind of Civil War ending kind of period. And I wonder if the dam breaking and the flood incident that Maggie had been referring to in the episode Two Rivers, if that's right around 1882, 
which could potentially be our theoretical theoretical maximum of people coming back. Wild stuff. Wayne, oh, wild stuff. my goodness. Now, I have two things about that. <laughs> I've always got two things, two sides of the coin and all that. Will the show Resurrection play along with these calculations and stick to those timelines? And is there any chance that it could go the other way? It would be a very mind-blowing thing. This would be like a season three thing of Resurrection. What if people are able to return that died in the future? You know, if you do the whole sign thing and actually do the proper math and the way that's all supposed to work out, you would actually get a future... Uh, amount because technically you'd have to include the 40 degrees that are between Arcadia and the equator with that minus 90 to the South Pole. So in theory, you could get a future date, in which case you could be from the future and come back to the present. That would be mind-blowing. And it would still hold to the theory. I'm Gary. Hi, Gary. (laughs) Who was that again? I'm Gary. Well, hi, Gary. Thank you so much. (laughs) Here's the key, Gary. You know what? When you have somebody kidnapped in your house, it's not good to use the telephone because people can triangulate that signal and find you. (laughs) So good to hear from you. Uh, Kevin Sizemore plays Gary Humphreys. You know, he's, he's a man of few words. One more time because it's so few words. I'm Gary. Maybe that was the deal, right? He kept it short so his call couldn't be traced. (laughs) That could be because we've learned from all those years of watching Jack Bauer on 24 and other uh, procedurals on television that got to keep the call short. So that was was good. What else you got, Troy? Uh, Brandon actually wrote (laughs) us this week. He said, what's up, guys? Great podcast. I was just listening to your initial reactions to home earlier this week. And at the end, when you guys were talking about Maggie going to the bald guy's house and asking if he was her dad... I think that was on the first or second show, second show. Uh, After all these weeks watching, I do believe now wholeheartedly that Maggie's mom already did come back Hmm. and that she is the one that the bald headed guy was talking to when, you know, Sam Catlin said she found us. Uh, You know, if you think about it, you know, everybody's eating a lot and grocery ate all those groceries that Elaine had bought. Uh, Jacob ate all the grilled cheese sandwiches. So if you actually think about it, you know, the bald headed guy was bringing food into the house, a lot, of, a lot of groceries in that episode too. And then later on when uh, Fred's actually at the bar talking about, you know, how he would do or not do anything to Sam if he found him, you know, again, he's ordering dinner for two or maybe dinner for one and Sam's just on a diet. <laughs> so, you, you know, somebody, somebody that has returned is in that house because he's buying a lot of groceries for one guy. But either way, great podcast. Bum that I'm just finding out about the podcast now, but I will definitely be listening from here on out. It's a great show, and I got all my friends and family watching. Thanks a lot, guys. Keep it up. Brandon. Excellent. Thank you so very much, Brandon. What a great observation. I am going to have to go back and watch all these episodes of Resurrection again. Of course, I've got the DVDs pre-ordered, so I'll be watching them that way. Yes. Now, the big question, of course, because we talked about it the other day, that uh, sure, Fred, you know, might put that wedding ring back on. But the only problem is, is that he has aged however long it's been since she died. Was it like 30 years, something like that? And if his wife returned, then she's still that same age as when uh, she and Jacob drowned. So that could be a romance issue. Yeah, because she would be, I would assume that she's probably, you know, mid 20s, late 20s when she dies, which puts, you know, Fred Summers in his, you know, mid 50s, maybe close to 60, you know, at the present day. So it would be an interesting conversation. Yeah. uh, Come back. Of course, we have fully open minds, May, December romances. We're, We're all into that. But it sounds like if that is her or whoever it is that's in that house, at this point, they seem to want to remain anonymous. But uh, I have a feeling with two episodes of Resurrection left, we're going to find out pretty quick. This is Neil from Bowie calling in to Resurrection Revealed for Resurrection Episode 6, Home. Rachel uh, felt compelled to come home. which was a surprise to her she wanted to leave Arcadia before she took her life. Maggie calls Eric Ward from NIH to help, and he notices that the ratio of the difference of latitude from Arcadia where they arrive on their return to the number of years since their original death was 0.38. 
Eric also wants to take Jacob from home to NIH in Bethesda to perform more tests. He sells this as a way to see if he can keep Jacob to keep from disappearing. At first, Jacob's parents agree, but then they change their mind. They're just going to make the most of however many days they have J Jacob here, keeping him home. The sheriff can't find anything on the recording of Caleb's disappearance from the jail. Uh, he discovers an arms store in the basement of Paul's house during a poker game. Paul showing it to him, telling him that uh, he has his back in case they need to repel a zombie invasion or something. Tom tells his wife, Janine, that Rachel is pregnant with his child. She doesn't take the news well. And she tells Helen about her unhappiness with this news. Tom, at the uh, church meeting, tries to keep his flock secure, telling them, we will survive as we always have by standing together as one. Or to paraphrase uh, Jack Shepard, live together, die alone. Helen causes an uproar at church with the news, making it seem that no one knows Tom anymore. She seems to imply that Tom got Rachel pregnant in the past day or so since she returned, not however many years ago it was, when Tom was just a teenager or something. Janine is not sorry about telling Helen, and when Tom won't respond to her accusation that he's still in love with Rachel, she leaves him. Gary wants the sheriff to find Caleb and make uh, Caleb pay for the crimes that he's done. But not finding Caleb, he and uh, another policeman uh, kidnap Rachel at the end of the episode for some mysterious reasons. Things are building up for the final two episodes. Will we see a sudden rush of new returnees? Will the kidnapping of Rachel release some mysterious powers or spark something else? Looking forward to the next two episodes. That's all. Neil, thank you so very much for uh, sending in that feedback and bringing up some great points and bringing the lost shout out. Live together, die alone. That was good stuff. And after talking about all this other stuff, I almost forgot about the basically uh, kidnapping. I hope she's safe. I hope so, too. But at the same time, you know, never get into a squad car, you know, with another guy in the back seat. That's going to be my motto. Well, Melly actually wrote in and she said that as a writer, I'm normally pretty good at figuring out plots before they are revealed. I've got nothing, not a thing. <laughs> Obviously, water is a connecting factor here. So akin to saying we throw out every time all the ladies at church or work pop up pregnant around the same time. So it must be something in the water. Thanks, Melly, for sending that in. And uh, Shaponis is actually back this week. And Shaponis said, hello, Resurrection Revealed podcast. I wanted to mention that I've actually been to NIH, although I was a baby at the time. According to my parents, they did not send me there for long because while some of the people there were very, very good, overall it was more research-orientated than patient-orientated. Hmm. They would send my parents pills and told them to give them to me without any explanation of what they did or what they were for. They would also request surgeries on short notice. There were, however, some departments of NIH that were extremely patient-orientated, but unfortunately, the bad sometimes outweighed the good, according to Shaponis and his parents. Take that for what it's worth. Hmm. Very interesting. Thanks for that background information, Shaponis, because I didn't know really what the NIH really did, other than I've heard the phrase, the abbreviation, but I've never heard anything really about them until resurrection and now this discussion. So very enlightening. And of course, there is always something in the water. And if there's a water cooler around, watch out. Hello, guys. This is Stephen from Wisconsin. Just want to give my two cents on the latest episode of Resurrection. Um, I definitely think, thought from the start, that that doctor that may have called in was a little sketchy and wanted Jacob only to come with him to be experimented on. But that was just my thought. Hope everybody has a happy Easter. Enjoy this bye week for the episode. And rev it up for the last two to the finale. Take care. Stephen, thank you so much for calling in to uh, 904-469-7469, leaving your thoughts on that. And yeah, we're looking forward to having a good Easter. And Troy, what do you think about his comments there? Further well, info? The real great thing about Eric Ward's character being introduced is that you know, now that he has the math and he's talking about, you know, going back to Bethesda to do some, you know, it's the best lab ever to do the tests that we need to do to find out what's really causing this issue is we have another lost shout out 
because now we have science versus faith. And we have that same theme going on because now we have the people that are trying to get to it from a medical perspective, but we also have Tom and the church stuff going down from a faith perspective. So, mm-hmm. you know, more and more we're getting close to the, you know, this is the new loss, like somebody tweeted out way back before the show started. I remember that. That definitely caught my attention. And I was already well targeted on watching Resurrection and doing the podcast about it before I even saw that. But when I saw that, I'm like, whoa, I wonder if there's more to this show than what they previewed in episode one. And obviously, things have really ramped up. In fact, Troy, I believe you got an email with some more uh, scientific side of theories going on. Yeah, Mike wrote in and he was talking about the whole multiverse concept. So he thinks the character gets the multiverse concept confused with possible worlds. Letting that go, in the Doctor's view, the parallel universe where the seemingly impossible exists to insert itself back into our universe. What would have existed is Rachel and the others die and come back to life in this universe. It might make sense if they had no recollection of dying or if they were pulled away at the last moment, but not the way it is put forward. So red herring, absolutely, which are good for, of course, cutting down forests. (laughs) I've got quite the visual. That's awesome. Um, but he, he does make a point here, you know, because, you know, we've been teasing, you know, Ray, Ray was like, you know, yeah, it's aliens. It's aliens, right? Mm-hmm. So it, it take the multiverse possible worlds, alternate timeline, but look at it from a different angle, right? Because I think that's what this show is all about is looking at things differently than what's on the surface and how you might interpret or understand things that you can't understand. What if it is another planet, which would assume aliens, but they're not aliens, they're humans. But on that planet, they have resurrection technology. And Mm -hmm. what happened was something went wrong on that planet. And for some reason, when they resurrected them, they beamed them back to our our planet. So it may be aliens, but in the sense DNA wise, they're really us when it comes to it. It's almost like a mirror world, but not in a different reality. It's actually the same universe. Oh my goodness. If it goes to something like that, it's going to be mind blowing on an incredible scale. Do do you mean uh, resurrection quote unquote technology, similar to what uh, the Cylons were using on the reboot of Battlestar Galactica? Could be, you never know. All the, all these shows seem to tie together some way, somehow. And that's a good thing. I think so. But, you know, if we can do anything, we can at least predict the future, right? Because at this point, anything's fair game. So Samantha actually wrote in for our last feedback this week, and she predicted that Caleb might be coming back next week in order to save Rachel from Gary. What do you think of that? That would be pretty uh, exciting. I can't imagine that happening the way that Caleb was. But then again... If they are from another dimension or another planet or an alien and they are able to kind of connect with each other, maybe he will. That would be very Jack Bauer like, I think, (laughs) if if we see Caleb again. But definitely, Samantha, if that happens, full credit, because that is one heck of a prediction there. Or it could be Sawyer like because Sawyer was kind of like the, you know, the bad guy in the first couple seasons. And then he turns out to be the good guy towards the end of the show and lost. So maybe he has a change of heart and he does, you know, fix up, fix whatever his his issues, you know, from that conversation he has with Elaine and Bellamy before he disappears. And maybe he comes back and he's good. I don't know. He had that look in his eye like, you know, more are coming more than you can ever imagine. And it's going to get messy and noisy and violent and. Maybe his prediction wasn't of that at all. We'll see. Well, we want to give some thanks to Rem and the gang over at the Sci-Fi Movie Podcast for playing our Resurrection Revealed promo on their show this past week. Uh, they're they're focused uh, on aliens, so definitely check them out over at the Sci-Fi Movie Podcast. Yeah, they do a great job on that show. In fact, I'm going to be on an upcoming episode talking all about the movie 12 Monkeys which was uh, recently announced as being morphed into some sort of series for uh, television. I believe the sci-fi channel possibly as well. 
But uh, I don't know how they're going to take 12 Monkeys and turn it into a series, but I love the movie. And so I love talking about it with uh, Rem and the gang on the Sci-Fi Movie Podcast. So that's coming up. Um, also, fellow voice actor Al Kessel played our promo on his newly branded Just Because inside the VoiceOver Studio Podcast this week. Al, you rock. Thank you for that. And we want to remind everybody... Resurrection Revealed is not yet affiliated with ABC Television or Plan B. Sure would love to be. In the meantime, would you consider supporting our fan podcast in a couple of ways? You can do all of your Amazon shopping through our affiliate link at resurrectionrevealed.com slash Amazon. You can even donate to the show to help us invest in making Resurrection Revealed even better going forward. You can donate once in any amount you like or you can even sign up for an ongoing monthly donation amount anything you do will uh, help this podcast and keep it rolling right along for you and of course don't forget every sunday not this coming sunday easter sunday but every other sunday after the east coast airing at 10 30 eastern 9 30 central you can join us live talking with other fans maybe some cast members as well as we discuss all the great happenings on resurrection until that time then i'm troy and i'm wayne henderson it, it at least 38% of me is. See you next time on Resurrection Revealed. Resurrection Revealed is a proud member of Noodle Mix Network. Get more of our award-winning and award-nominated podcasts to help you think, laugh, and succeed at noodle.mx. Like Beyond the To-Do List with Eric J. Fisher. Great tips on how to be more productive in your personal and professional life when you go Beyond the To-Do List over at noodle.mx.